Hey, what's up? Today, we're talking about hernias. Did I get it right or I missed it? Oh, is this I should be here? Hernia. So this was a little complicated, it's a little different. There are multiple types of hernias. This is probably gonna be a three, four, or five part conversation because all hernias are not the same. We're gonna break them down in the most common ones that everybody sees, and then kinda of just say, hey, this is what this is. So the first thing we're gonna do is go over inguinal hernias. So inguinal hernias come in two fashions. You have direct and indirect hernias. Femoral hernias are different than inguinal hernias because inguinal hernias come out of the inguinal canal versus femoral hernias come out of a femoral defect in the pelvis. We'll talk about why we're grouping them together once we cover ventral hernias and hiatal hernias. Quick, quick, quick thing. A ventral hernia is any hernia that comes out the anterior abdominal wall that includes umbilical hernias as well as hernias around the falciform ligament, hernias from surgery, from open exploration or anything. Hiatal hernia, completely different issue, has nothing to do with the abdominal wall, but it is still a hernia. A hernia, by definition, basically means there's a hole in a fascial plane, and then something is sticking through it. In an inguinal hernia, you have two types. You have a direct hernia and an indirect hernia. A direct hernia is a weakness of the abdominal wall. It is typically seen in somebody that does a lot of lifting, someone that is older. A indirect hernia can be from that same process, but is usually from a patent processus vaginalis. What that basically means is when you're a baby, when you develop, your testicles start up in your abdominal wall and then they drop down. In order for that to happen, they drag a piece of the peritoneum with them. When it does that, there's a potential space. Usually what happens is that area fuses and nothing goes in it. If it stays open, you can have an indirect hernia. And that's when you see hernias in children that are born. They have usually indirect hernias starting out. If you have partial fusion, so the top of it is fused, but the bottom is open, you can get a hydrocell. So hydrocell is basically a collection of fluid in that sac but you necessarily don't have a hernia where intestinal contents are coming through. When we talk about intestinal contents, it can be an appendix, it can be part of your bladder, it can be part of your colon. So all of that can come down into a hernia and it really just depends on what type it is. Direct versus indirect, another difference is that an indirect, of course, has a sac. A direct is a weakness in the abdominal wall. It does have a peritoneal covering, but it's not as important to remove it because of the way that we repair it. With a inguinal hernia, it traditionally occurs, Goku's penis got moved. It typically occurs right here over where these vessels are. The reason that's important is you can think of it if you stand or sit for a long time, the artery and the vein have to have room to come from in your belly out into your leg to provide blood supply. So if you don't create a small space or an area that is pliable and movable, you eventually would cut off the blood supply to both of these when you stand or sit. Brown, give me the brown. Got it. <clears throat> so the testicle here drops down and the cord structures come just a little bit medial to this. So this whole area is weak to accommodate the ability of the testicle to drop down when you're a child into the scrotum, as well as room for the artery in the vein so you have good blood supply. With this repair, there are two ways to do it. When you talk about a inguinal hernia, a direct hernia, you have to remove the sac. What that means is you can't just go in, push it back in, and it's done. You have to remove the sac so that you close off that patent processus vaginalis. There's still a hole there, but the vessel comes below the hole, 
So what we can do is put a small piece of mesh in the hole just to plug it. So that's the plug part of a patch and plug repair for inguinal hernia. Now, the direct hernia, because it's a weakness in the floor, you don't have to ligate a sac, but what you do is reinforce that inguinal floor. That's the patch part. So when people say patch and plug for an inguinal hernia, the patch is for the direct, the plug is for the indirect, usually accompanying a ligation of that sac. You can do it as patch then plug. Some places actually have a combination patch and plug, so you kind of dig it out and put it in. I just use regular old patch and plug. From a recurrence standpoint, the recurrence rate of a open inguinal hernia repair is about less than 1%. You can do it laparoscopically, you can do it with a robot. Um, that hernia recurrence rate is about 2 to 3%. It's kind of counterintuitive because if you think of a hernia as a bucket of water and there's a hole in it and water is leaking out, what you would think works better is putting the patch on the inside of the bucket and the water is holding it in place. That's what a laparoscopic repair is. And there's tip, there's tap, there's different types. But the one that works the best is actually just putting a piece of duct tape on the outside of it and keeps everything in and ligating the sac. Again, I think it has to do more with the physics of the fact that the pelvis and that part of it has to be able to wax and wane. And if you put something fixed, especially on the inside, it doesn't work as well. As far as making the diagnosis, femoral hernias. Femoral hernias are not as important from a direct versus indirect because you can tell the difference. The main difference is that inguinal hernias can become incarcerated sometimes, but it's usually because of their size. Femoral hernias, which are more common in females than males, usually strangulate. So those are the ones that cause obstructions that we end up having to resolve surgically. The biggest way to tell the difference between a direct versus indirect is on physical exam and the signs and symptoms that people have. But the repair is usually the same, so it really doesn't make a difference. As far as the signs and symptoms, groin pain, swelling. The swelling usually comes and goes. If they lay down or in the morning when they're in the bed, the swelling goes away. When they wake up and walk, the swelling stays all day. So that's the best way to tell as to whether or not someone has a hernia. You can have pain plus or minus with urination. That just depends on how big the hernia is and whether or not part of the bladder is in the hernia sac. Dyspareunia, fancy word for pain with sex, not the good way, but pain with sex. That is caused by either the swelling is so big that it's uncomfortable or you're pulling part of the support ligaments into the hernia. That's a big reason that a lot of men come in complaining of groin pain. Also, when they're lifting anything heavy or bearing down, which is basically a valsalva maneuver, that causes pain and discomfort. The difference between night and day is again, resting versus walking around. If they're walking around during the day, the testicle is hanging, swollen, and causes them discomfort, whereas the night they rest, it reduces, and they don't have that pain. Constipation is a sign that usually you see on the left side, not the right side. That's because on the left, the sigmoid colon is redundant, and you can sometimes get part of the sigmoid colon into a hernia sac on the left. That results in constipation or a difficulty completing a colonoscopy because the colon is stuck in the hernia and just about any other thing. People complain of weird shooting pains when they have a inguinal hernia. They'll complain of numbness sometimes when they walk too long. They'll complain of just a host of pain shooting down their legs and their inner thighs, but it usually is all centered around the lower pelvis. Since hernias are more common in men than women, typically the complaints are based in their pelvis and there's nothing else going on other than constipation and appendicitis. As far as separating whether someone has diverticulitis, appendicitis, whatever, that's hard with an inguinal hernia. You also sometimes have patients that are a little larger or they have hernias that come and go. In 
the pediatric population, what we tell parents is as soon as the testicle is swollen or the hernia is sticking out, take a picture of it for us so we can make sure that we're dealing with the right thing. In adults, we don't do that as much. We typically turn to different modalities to make the diagnosis. So if someone has a difficult hernia that we can't see on physical exam based on the symptoms that they complain of, we typically go with CT or ultrasound. The CAT scan is used to look and see if they have a hernia and it does a great job of that. The ultrasound is used to determine whether or not it's a hydrocele, it's a torsion of the testicle or something else. As far as making that diagnosis, once you have it, you then have to decide what the next step is. More than likely, it's gonna be a surgical repair. There's not really any rest or anything like that that we can do that's non-operative to fix a hernia because it's a physical problem. Multiple different ways to do it, laparoscopic versus open, mesh versus no mesh, elective versus urgent. The first thing I would say is if you have to do one, whether it's an elective surgery versus urgent surgery, an elective hernia repair has a much better success rate. Urgent repairs have a lot of edema, they're hard, um, difficult, but they're usually necessary, but not that common. Mesh versus no mesh, mesh. You always want a mesh repair unless you have an infection that you can't put mesh in. So you should have an inguinal hernia repair with mesh. If you have a femoral repair, plus or minus mesh is okay. And that just is usually because femoral hernias present as incarcerated hernias, and you have to decide whether or not the intestine is viable or not. If the intestine is dead, then you would use no mesh. But if it's not, consider putting a piece of mesh in. Laparoscopic versus open, dealer's choice. The robot is kind of the new hot thing that everybody's doing. So we some of these are done laparoscopically, some of these done with the robot. If you are someone that needs your hernia fixed and you don't feel like dealing with recurrences, you don't feel like doing anything but getting it done and keep it moving, I recommend an open repair. The only thing is if you have bilateral inguinal hernias, the right way to do it is laparoscopically. The difference between a bilateral inguinal hernia repair versus a unilateral inguinal hernia repair, one versus two, a laparoscopic approach is better from a pain standpoint. If you have bilateral inguinal hernias and you try to do it open, those patients can't walk. They hate their surgeon for the next three to four weeks. And every time I've done it, every patient has regretted it. And they all said, doc, you were right. I should have done the right one first and then, do, then had the left done. So I would not recommend doing a bilateral inguinal hernia repair that's open. I would do it laparoscopically or with a robot. As far as follow-up, a couple of things. Pain, swelling, numbness, bleeding, that's pretty much the same grouping of complications you see after surgery for any surgery. So you always wanna watch out for that stuff. With incarceration of a hernia, which is usually a femoral hernia, it's a little different. The main reason is sometimes we put a scope in laparoscopically to look and see if the abdomen has any dead bowel. If it has dead bowel, you have to resect it, then that patient is in the hospital for two or three days. If it's not dead bowel, you can reduce it and do a femoral hernia repair with a piece of mesh, and those patients do fine. But because it's a harder presentation, it's a little harder recovery, but all of the pain, swelling, numbness, bleeding stuff still applies. That pretty much covers inguinal hernias and femoral hernias. If you have any questions, again, message me, DM me, Instagram, YouTube, put it in the comments and we'll get it taken care of. Part two, we'll start talking about ventral hernias. Again, similar process, but there's some tricks to it. And then finally, hiatal hernias. Hope this covers everything, guys. Take care.